Thank you so much for coming on a Saturday afternoon, which is hard work to get off the couch sometimes, so I'm really appreciative of you being here. My name is Kemi Adeyemi. I am an assistant professor here at the University of Washington in the Gender, Women, Sexuality Studies Department. Um, and I want to, you know, sort of very briefly introduce our guest speaker today, why she's here, and what we're, what we're doing as a group together. Um, so today, Taylor Renee Aldridge is visiting us from Detroit uh, to present the talk, Performing Interior, Performing Interior Pleasure, the Somatic Work of Jennifer Harge. Uh, Taylor is a curator, critic, and arts writer who uh, works to investigate the intersections of equity, race, and culture in and outside of cultural institutions. And Taylor is visiting us today through the project that I run called the Black Embodiment Studio, which is an arts writing incubator for graduate students um, of the entire, all, all of the UW campuses. Um, and actually, no, not just to people who are enrolled at UW, so to people who are invested in arts criticism. Um, anyway, the Black Embodiment Studio is a, an arts writing incubator that explores how definitions of blackness are produced and expressed in contemporary art. Residents of the studio read and discuss arts criticism while visiting Seattle galleries that are exhibiting black artists. One of the studio's primary functions is to provide space for students to develop their own short pieces of arts criticism surrounding black embodiments. Uh, so, you know, the goal is sort of helping students bring the skills they have as research-based thinkers in the academy and bring them to bear on other modes and other genres of writing, sometimes within the academy, but also just to kind of be outward facing um, in a lot of different kinds of venues. So I'm excited to be able to bring Taylor here uh, because of the ways that she has herself directly shaped arts critical discourse surrounding black makers. And this has happened through essays, curating, facilita facilitating public programs, working as an advisor to a variety of projects. In 2014, she co-founded Arts Black with Jessica Lynn, an online publication for arts criticism from black perspectives, predicated on the belief that arts criticism should be an accessible dialogue, a tool through which we question, celebrate, and talk back to the global world of contemporary art. Taylor received her MLA from Harvard University with a concentration in museum studies. She received her BA from Howard University with a concentration in art history and business administration. Taylor has worked at the Ethelbert Cooper Gallery of African and African American Art at Harvard and has been awarded with the Goldman Sachs Junior Fellowship at the National Museum of American History, which is part of the Smithsonian Institute. She's written for Parkett, Parkett, Parkett? Parkett, Art News, Hyperallergic, Art 21, and Contemporary And. So I want to welcome Taylor here. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Uh, thank you, Kimmy, for bringing me out. Um, your invitation came at a really uh, great time because I was working through um, a paper that I'm going to present tonight on the work of Jennifer Harge, who is a Detroit-based performance artist and dancer, primarily mining um, narratives related to black queer embodiment through the body um, and through performance. Um, a little bit more about me, I founded Arts.Black, co-founded Arts.Black with Jessica Lynn, um, and a lot of my work in, the, in recent years has been really informed by place um, and, my, and sort of marked by my coming home to Detroit um, and grappling with a lot of the narratives that were um, sort of surfacing during that time that didn't really fit with the Detroit that I knew. Um, specifically within the arts community, there was a lot of sensationalism, a lot of just a uh, miscontextualization of the artist in the city. Um, so I felt the need to uh, make a commitment to properly contextualize what was happening in my city um, in this really important time of, of transition. Um, so I'll begin, this, uh, this paper that I'm presenting is, is a draft. It hasn't been published yet. It's gonna be on arts.black's site uh, by the end of summer. Um, and I'm hoping to uh, continue to write about Jennifer Harge's work. Uh, I started sort of uh, meeting with Jennifer, uh, befriending Jennifer about a year ago. We both received uh, this award called the Kresge Grant, uh, which is a, a pretty important grant that uh, is disseminated to artists in Detroit. Um, and 
I think we had, we just realized that we had a lot of kindred interest um, in the contemporary art world. And I started just studying alongside her and we sort of would exchange readers. Um, and it's really this, this sort of form of uh, criticism as care or uh, exchanging with artists in ways that are a little bit more intentional uh, to better inform my criticism has been a way that I've, I've realized that I like to work as a critic and as an arts writer. Um, so I'll begin. Uh, on a recent unusually cold spring evening in Detroit, I parked my car in front of the Museum of Contemporary Art uh, in Detroit. I walked into the warehouse like space after greeting a few friends and I looked, I took a seat in one of the black chairs that was situated uh, in the space. There were a series of two rows of black chairs that surround the impromptu stage on all sides of the multi-purpose area of the museum. The square-shaped stage was viewable in the round. As I sat, I noticed that several large bottles of Hennessy, a notable co French cognac, is being passed around to audience members, along with a stack of plastic cups for us to pour the liquor into. As I looked up, I saw a gaze from a small balcony area. A person was looking down as people entered the, and settled into the space. The person did not announce her presence or the fact that she was indeed spectating. I then realized that the onlooker is the choreographer um, responsible for this event, Jennifer Harch. While me and the rest of the audience members zealously partook in complimentary libations, four black women in white colored leotards and sheer calf length skirts created a barrier around the stage between the audience members' feet and the presumed stage. They did this by placing empty Cigarello Swisher Sweet wrappers, empty bottles of Hennessy, tobacco, candles, and white barrettes in a neat fashion around the stage's perimeter. Shortly after the simulated altar has been set, the ritual commences. The performance, entitled Feds Watching, is a movement work by Jennifer Harge. Um, the movement work by Jennifer Harge and Harge Dance Stories with choreographer, excuse me, with choreography imagined by Detroit-based artist Jennifer Harge, founder of the dance company. The series of movements that follow are intended to subvert the surveillance of, of blackness by remapping and manipulating the somatic impulses learned as a result of surveilled black embodiment. The production is the first installment of a larger evening length work entitled Fly Drown. At a particular juncture in the performance, two of the four women included in the ritualistic dance displayed a pronounced tension between the desire to fly and the desire to, and need to collapse. One dancer imitated an organism in flight. She danced around the stage gracefully in her litur liturgical dress while another surveilled her movement. Looking onward with a penetrating gaze, she directs to the dancer who is strategically stumbling about, do not drown. This mantra is repeated and emboldened for several minutes as the woman continues to dance, seemingly battling her own desire to collapse, but also wanting to sustain. Do not drown. I'm just gonna show a, a clip of this moment in the performance.
This gesture in the performance takes up dancer and scholar Anna Martine Whitehead's assertion on collapse and freedom. Freedom, Whitehead proclaims, is the moment you might have fallen, but have everyone, everyone convinced otherwise. We do not stop collapsing. Freedom is at once the fall, the performance of not falling, and the awareness, awareness of all that comes after, she says. The we, in this case, is a queer black performer. The sequence in Feds, and, Feds Watching was a performance as, of accessing self-possession in a black embodiment a queer embodiment, as well as the finesse and trickery that emerges during this tension, even in light of collapse, loss, and pain. Throughout her performance, the artist Jennifer Harge has dedicated her work to defining and performing a being real black, excuse me, being real black choreography, a flying to keep from drowning choreography. In a text that accompanied the Feds, Feds watching show, the artist writes, this choreography listens to the lessons learned from those who leaped into the Atlantic, who ran north and mailed themselves north. It listens to those whose deaths we witness on our screens and whose deaths we will experience in the future. This choreography was created because we have grown up being watched and as a result have inherited a docile body. But this choreography is about renegotiating those edges, renaming ourselves, and forging a black authority in a world shaped by them watching us. This choreography does not give a fuck about being watched, and if you end up sitting next to them while you watch this, don't worry about it. They not gonna get these codes anyway. We made this choreography for you, a choreography to consider how we might move beyond or beyond slippery eyes. We have we have gotten familiar with losing, collapsing, and dying, Jennifer Harge writes, but begin to think about your freedom choreography, your flying to keep from drowning choreography, being real black choreography. So if we consider Richard Bauman's definition of performance as a mode of communicative behavior and a type of communicative event, Jennifer Harge's work does this and then some particularly targeting her communication to the group of black folks who are a part of her mixed audiences. Her use of codes shows up in the performance through a range of tactics, vernacular movements, and uses of ephemera that are specific to black ontological subjectivity. She works to make certain that specific communicative codes are legible for some and illegible for others. Hard specifically distinguish, distinguishes these groups through her use of we and they, intentionally refusing to define who the they or we are for the sake of this intersubjective communication. The lack of didactics suggests that if you know, you know. If you don't, then you're not supposed to. Harsh does this in, in an effort to not only ex include or exclude, but to make the work impossible to commodify by people who are not, not a part of the subjectivity the performance works to celebrate. Through a series of code switches, both text and body movement, Harge's work takes up the form of the hidden tradition, a term that Kevin Young, poet Kevin Young, presents in the Gray album, The Blackness of Blackness. He reminds us that the secretive nature of black performance, whether quotidian or in the arena of fine art, is a manner taken up not only for survival, but for perseverance and preservation. He writes, this notion of hiding the hiding tradition in both senses that in African American culture, there is a tradition of hiding one's self, life, loves, and more often in plain sight, and that there is also a sense of the black imaginative tradition being overlooked. The two are related, if not in the way it may seem at first. The tradition of hiding versus the hidden tradition emerges as a defense long before it, is, before it was lost an underground railroad meaning to survive, a second site of redress, freedom, and a cultural design to destroy any remnants of Africa or inherit humanity of an African being. In regard to Harge's work, I'm interested in Young's statement of redressing freedom in a culture, culture designed to destroy. 
In our present day, the dynamic between blackness and efforts of white supremacy is not only that of the oppressed and the oppressor, but that of cultural creator and appropriator, the exploited and the exploiter, specifically in the realm of contemporary fine art. While there is an active widening of the canon to include more artists and discourses of color, spectators, patrons, collectors, and bastions of this culture, uh, those with the most power, are still predominantly white. Harge's choreography anticipates and considers the fact that much of her audiences may not reflect the subjects she seeks to reference and honor in her work. And so she moves to converse exclusively with an audience, within an audience. In doing so, she creates an intersubjective and interior dialogue within a public white space and seeks to make it, quote unquote, real black. The real blackness is only identifiable to those audience members who have had real, real black experiences. The real blackness choreography can be performed through the sharing of a dark cognac, a collective or individual twerking session, or the employment of a white plastic barrette, commonly used to secure the loose ends of a black girl's hair. She asserts through this work that aspects of a collective identity can be performed as a formal aesthetic quality. Harge's intersubjective communication and refusal to explain the use or origins of such vernacular materials is rooted in a certain reclamation of power, a power that Audre Lorde has termed the erotic. In Uses of the Erotic, Audre Lorde explains that the erotic is a measure between the beginnings of our sense of self and the chaos of our strongest feelings. It is an internal sense of satisfaction to which, once we have experienced the fullness of this depth of feeling and recognizing its power and honor and self-respect, we can require no less of ourselves. Lorde's manifesto on the erotic, her instructive account on how to locate it within ourselves, is a call to action for black, queer, self-identified women who are assets in a system that is not reciprocal. The system, in my opinion, is defined by its prioritization of patriarchy, whiteness, capitalism, and hedge money. In this system, women, black, and queer people have the least amount of power, and specifically a person embodying all of the aforementioned identities is arguably the most powerless and most, most injured within this framework. With this in mind, Harge subtly poses the questions in her work, what if black queer bodies were the default in a non-patriarchal, decentered whiteness narrative? What does the performance of this narrative look like? It begins with imagination, a deep rumination on overcoming grief, accessing freedom, and experiencing pleasure. Jennifer Harge's practice is invested in the use of the erotic as power as a means of performing what feminist scholar Jennifer C. Nash has named interior pleasure. Fed's watching and the rest of Harge's work acknowledges the reality of corporeal em embodiment that is so inextricably wrapped up in the lineage of black interior communication codes. And she charts new territories for her audiences, specifically those who are black, to imagine what it would be like to commit to their own respective vitality and pleasure. This pleasure deeply depends on the hidden tradition and the act of hiding in plain sight to subvert gazes and destroy disjoint traditional manners of audiences looking during performance. Harge's path towards performing the embodying, excuse me, performing and embodying pleasure is an act of recovery work as well. Nash tells us that black women's bodies and visual culture are often symbolically used as exposés that are deployed to reveal a certain kind of pain, injury, and freedom. In her book, Black Bodies and Ecstasy, Reading, Race, and Pornography, Nash argues that in particular, the black feminist theoretical archive is an archive of pain that traces a set of harms and injuries, exposes a set of violences and champions strategies of redress. The performance work of Jennifer Harge, I argue, is a manner of redressing and recovering, but also a reimagining of the capability of black female vitality, specifically focusing on those in a queer embodiment. 
Utilizing Lord's essay on the erotic as a guiding methodology, Harge personifies and makes space for the opacity of pleasure while making visible how certain bodies may collapse in pain, provided by collective and individual lived experiences in a black embodiment. This act is most present in her 2016 work entitled Her Stories Project, uh, which comes from, um, which is uh, first performed in 2016. Uh, Harge and several black women, uh, the women who were also included in the Fed's watching performance, uh, performed a 90 minute uh, performance within an abandoned church within Detroit um, during the year of 2016. The fragmented title gives way to the breath of glitches and work in the, excuse me, breath of glitches that the work encompasses. It is not at all linear, tracking the myriad of experiences a black queer woman has encountered in both grief and resilience. It begins with Harge and other performers running in place while reading the names of hundreds of people who were unjustly killed by American police officers. Just want to play a clip from this moment in the performance. For almost 20 minutes, the dancers run in place. As time passes, their breaths become shallow. Perspiration on their respective lobes become more and more visible. Their fatigue is palpable. The title of this sequence, I learn later, is More Never Tire. What's made clear in the literal metaphor for the, for the endurance that is required, excuse me, what's made clear is a literal metaphor for the endurance that is required for loving and living in a black body. After mourn and never tire, and a liturgical praise sweeping accompanied by Aretha, Franklin, Aretha Franklin's precious Lord, Harge commands that the entire stage, excuse me, Harge commands the entire stage all on her own and carries out a series of mo movements over the song The Mob by rapper Lil Wayne. Her movement in this sequence becomes more improvisational and layered. She appears to try on the persona of Lil Wayne by giving off a drag king, the effect of a drag king performance. Moving about the stage in sweatpants and a sweatshirt, her arms and hands mimic the, mimic the flow of Lil Wayne's cadence. Her hand is sometimes formed in the shape of a gun that she projects and shoots towards the audience, then suddenly she adopts a more effeminate gesture and moves into a series of twerking sessions. Her back and buttocks face the audience. She turns her head around to place her wide-eyed gaze onto an audience member and continues to twerk. The act becomes another effort of endurance and perhaps pleasure. I'm most interested in this oscillation between uh, Jennifer's uh, transitions of adopting both, both masculine and feminine forms. Just gonna show a little clip of this performance as well. The lineage of hip hop performance is mostly involved with gestures of confidence and aggression to accompany the bravado of a rapper's lyricism. This is often performed through a certain type of dominating movements, directive hands, stern gazes, and a reserved and protective demeanor. 
The machismo in hip hop, though, is more than just performative. It's a gesture that is wrapped up in the prosthetic memory and trauma tied to black existence in America. In her book, When the Chicken Heads Come Home to Roost, a hip hop feminist breaks it down. Joan Morgan writes, the seemingly impenetrable wall of sexism in rap music is really the complex mask African Americans often wear to hide and express pain. At the close of this millennium, hip hop is still one of the few forums in which young black men, even surreptitiously, are allowed to express pain. Harge's decision to perform this machismo after recalling the names of black people who have been killed unjustly by the police becomes an embodiment of grief, a way of hiding or getting through pain, as Morgan has asserted. As Jennifer Harge commits to ev evoking this masculinity in her, her, her story's performance, she suddenly transitions to twerking and gazing. In doing so, she challenges hegemonic understandings that hypermasculinity and hyperfemininity cannot exist together. Through this performance, Harge asserts that a spectrum of both performative aspects can, can be carried out in one body. In this vastness of expression of what is, what is perceived to be Harge's authentic inner self, it becomes a certain <coughs> performance pleasure that is not bound by the limitations of heteronormative expectation. The performance continues on, oscillating between several distinct movements, from a body in distress, flailing about to recovery, a rhythmic vernacular movement that invokes a visual language of improvisation and pure joyousance. Accompanying this movement is a set list that is seemingly random, but one that may be specific to a black interior space, including songs by Aretha Franklin, Rick Ross, Lil Wayne, and uh, Mahalian Jackson. Get back to this. This work ultimately pivots from endurance and recovery and nestles within pleasure. It, did, it does not seek to satisfy the expectations of the audience as much as it does implicate and disrupt the dynamic between viewer and performer. Throughout her performances, Harj may stare firmly into the eyes of an audience member while twerking robustly. Back to the audience, face turned so that you may, not, you may only see her side profile and her body in tandem with the rhythms provided. To which audiences who are familiar with this gesture of twerking may engage and encourage in, encourage in the vernacular celebratory movement of fellowship, whereas outsiders are often unsure of how to engage and sometimes made uncomfortable. To embolden the practice of this movement and its clandestine protocol, often executed in the mundane or domestic space, Harge and, and the other dancers in the performance commit to scenes of joy. They prepare to go to the club, they drink libations, play music, and twerk about as they get dressed and put on makeup. And an imagination of the future of what Elizabeth Alexander has described as the black interiority. The most intersubjective blackness of blackness. What this means for both Whitehead and Harge is that commitment to the freak technique or queer movement is to quote unquote, ex to exist outside of the laws of capital, to be bold and creative and at risk. This is an act that is simultaneously life affirming and indicative of potential social as well as corporeal death. This often looks like an improvisational glitching of the body, a self possession and a somatic jerking and twerking in Jennifer's work. In the passage for feds watching, Harge acknowledges a history of the black escapism throughout the Americas and the black Atlantic. And through her evocation of this history, she encourages black audience members to employ the performance of escape, a sort of faking it till you make it to achieve a certain transcendence from fugitivity out of, a, out of the familiarity of loss, collapse, and corporeal mortality. In Embodied Avatars, Yuri McMillan reminds us that the lineage of escapism 
and resistance within black American life has always been rooted in a gesture of performativity. He writes, the embodied acts of resistance were not just descendant tactics. These furtive, movement, these furtive moves, I believe, were a kind of performance. Mac Macmillan specifically recalls the story of William and Ellen Craft, who literally performed roles of slave master, Ellen Craft, and his slave, William Craft, to travel north and escape slavery in the 19th century. Similarly, in Harge's performance, she invokes the history of Henry Box Brown in the line where she writes, this choreography listens to the lessons learned from those who mailed themselves to freedom. Brown was born enslaved in Louisa County, Virginia in 1850 and worked on a plantation in Richmond, Virginia for much of his early life. After watching his wife and three children sold off to another plantation, he developed the courage to strategize his way towards freedom. Brown then asked a white abolitionist to mail himself to freedom. And in 1849, he was mailed via the Adams Express Company in a box that was three feet long, uh, two inches deep, and two feet wide. Traveling for nearly 27 hours in the box, he escaped fugitivity through a quote unquote performance to reach freedom. The performance, although less cosmetic and theatrical than the crafts, required an endurance, but an investment in imaginations of a future freedom. This endurance and imagination to transcend oppression is at the crux of what motivates Harge's choreography. Yet this escapist performativity is more so concerned with how black people, particularly a black woman in a queer embodiment, may find escape through uh, the quotidian or mundane, uh, the less glamorous day-to-day uh, -day sans black girl magic ideology. In this regard, Harge's choreography is, excuse me, in this regard, Harge's choreography is an essential embodiment of Lucille's, Lucille Clifton's going on women who got used to making it through murdered sons, who kept on pushing, who fried chicken, who ironed, who stepped off the back steps, who grief kept. And that is it. Thank you. Any questions? Not all at once, please. <laughs> We can move to the reception. That's fine with me. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I sort of, when um, you were talking about, I have like a thought that's not fully formed yet, mm -hmm. and it's, it's uh, I think a little bit bigger than the particular scenario of Harge, but I sort of hear you talking about how the specific choreography through the choreography we see a kind of movement between, or maybe like from one to the next from endurance to pleasure to escapism. That's also how the, the talk is structured. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think in a lot of ways, we think of those three terms, endurance, pleasure, and escape, as kind of um, end points or like mm -hmm. time periods that mm -hmm. are closed. So we think about the we think about history and the past as like just pure endurance, right? Or, or you know, pleasure is like purely in the moment, or escape is like purely like this thing that we might somehow get to. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you're describing her choreography as, a, as demonstrating a real investment in like mundane, quotidian, everyday, it's mm -hmm. kind of slog. Mm -hmm. um, which I think some, in some respects gives us a different kind of timeline for thinking about black movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I, I think of it in terms of Harge's practice as something that is practice, a, a daily commitment, as opposed to something we're just performing and sort of carrying out to, as a means to an end. You know, it's something that is embodied and something that should be practiced beyond this specific dance or this specific event. Um, and I think that's really what she's interested in as a performance artist, particularly who is more perf uh, dealing with the more ephemeral art making, right? This thing is performed, and then we all leave and we go. But she's hoping to really invoke a certain practice to think about these movements 
when you take this, pra this sort of dance back home with you, particularly for black queer women, if that makes sense. Yes. Uh, my question is more about like the, you talked a little bit about the misconception, the, the misconceptions that were going on with artists in Detroit, mm -hmm. and then which prompted your intervention. Can you say a little more about that? Sure. Um, so I got to Detroit in 2014 after being away for seven years. I was, you know, in undergrad, grad school, and I came back to write my thesis and I didn't plan to like stay. I was just like, Detroit is still shit. There's a lot of divestment there. I don't know if I could get a job. Like I'll just go there and just like zone out and finish my thesis. I get there and I realize that there are a lot of people um, not from the city recently moved, people who recently moved to the city who are very present in the narratives that are being shaped about the city in New York Times and all these different articles, these major articles um, that are shaping Detroit as like this comeback city, right? Um, so you have people who don't really know the histi history or lineage of this very black city. It's 80% black and has been 80% black for several decades. Um, and the city has birthed a lot of contributions by um, black identified people from Motown to, you know, different types of musicians, artists, all types of things. Um, and so in my perspective and in my observations, a lot of that history was being, was just not being considered. Uh, a lot of black artists weren't being included um, in that narrative. Um, and so I felt compelled and sort of responsible, excuse me, as a emerging, emerging writer, um, emerging curator, to sort of uh, provide a counter narrative to what was happening um, and assert some truth or insert some truth into these like more global narratives ar around the contemporary art community in Detroit and that it's not just a blank slate um, where artists from Seattle can just come and you know, start up residencies and claim that there are no artists here. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Can you talk um, about um, Maya Stovall's work? Sure, yeah. Sure. Um, I, I love Maya Stovall's mind and practice. I think she's a brilliant person who is really interested in uh, minimalist performance, has a, a really uh, great awareness of like that lineage of minimalist performance and how it influences her work. Um, but I think I appreciate her work and I appreciate her like, re like centering her um, movement um, on a particular neighborhood in Detroit that's very familiar. Um, but I think my problem with that work and specifically, specifically of being in, at the Whitney Biennial is contextualizing it, you know, and making sure that it's not uh, this sort of site for people to just be a voyeurs in, you know, in a way. Um, it's a very uh, interior space. Um, it's a very, it's a, 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 where she filmed the liquor store theater um, is in an area that is transitioning, but predominantly poor, low income. Um, and so what does it mean to sort of platform this space as an outsider? Maya is from Detroit, but she's not necessarily within, of and within this community that she was videotaping these liquor store theaters in. What does it mean to be an outsider, to platform this, these corners, these liquor store sites, these sites of economy, um, and present them in a, a white, predominantly white box museum space? I think you just have to be really careful in how you contextualize that for viewers. And I'm not sure if that necessarily was contextualized properly um, by the museum, as was many other works in that show. Um, but I think the piece is, is uh, important. Um, and I think it, I like that it does platform uh, people that you wouldn't normally see on museum walls, 
you know, and they are experts of their own experiences because they are people that actually frequent those corners and who are actually from Detroit um, and know the area very well, people who grew up in the area. Um, so I do appreciate that, but I just, as a curator, as a writer, I'm just like worried about the context and how, how we're like leaving breadcrumbs for these things to be consumed and in what ways are we directing people to consume these images. Yes. No, thank you. I think what, and especially what it enabled me to do or think about was the ways in which you can think about the black body without seeing visceral violence. Mm. And I think the videos that you showed us, which I think I'm in the black embodiment studio, but I, and which makes me think about what are, like you said in your talk, other sites in which we can think about black life without trying to like the visceral and the grotesque. Um, I was wondering if you found or what you would identify as like black interior um, pleasure when you were looking at the archives of a slavery archive, in particular for black women, right? Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned um, the, I forgot his name, but the person who mailed himself to Rio. Henry Brown. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then also other uh, performative aspects that black men during the time of slavery have taken on in order, um, I don't know, to get to freedom, etc. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? I, I mean, I don't know. What does that look like? And how does it sort of travel in between the new pleasure in the scheme? I don't know if mm -hmm. this is a fair mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's a question that I'm asking myself too, you know, and what does that look like? I'm not a historian. I won't claim to know all of Henry Box Brown's uh, life, um, but he did write an autobiography, which I would encourage you all to read. Um, it's a fascinating story, but what was most interesting to me is that he, after he had himself like mailed um, to freedom, he became a magician and he sort of became known as this man who traveled in a box to access freedom. And, you know, I, I just kind of wonder, like, what is lost? Like, d did he find that pleasurable? I find that hard to believe that there is pleasure in that and sort of, like, um, doing a thing that you have to do or that you feel compelled to do and then it becoming a sort of commodity. Um, it's, it's a fine line between performing pleasure, because I think it could be just as easily pleasurable for your audiences, and you know that really doesn't allow you to find pleasure in it when you're, I don't know. I, I, I think your question is spot on, because I'm still working through that. Um, and just like a conversation that I have with Jennifer a lot as a person who is using their body as material to like tell these stories and also subvert gazes how do you find pleasure in that? Um, and how do you refuse to be, like how do you resist being a commodity? You know, it's something that she actively has to think about. And this is why she, you know, particularly has these communicative codes. And like, it, it's just like a constant practice of like trying to resist and anticipate um, ways in which your work can easily be commodified. Um, and I think that's part of the pleasure, at least for Jennifer Harge. So if in that context, mm -hmm. one of the problems is that there's a kind of lack of contextualization when it was at the Whitney, but you were also talking about how Jennifer d does not provide wall didactics, mm -hmm. does not provide like text-based kind of information. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I was wondering about those, those are two sort of different, but mm -hmm. we have like a, a poor contextualization and a lack of, mm -hmm. a deliberate lack of contextualization. Are those, yeah, how are those two kind of moments working for you? I think, um, particularly in, in Maya Stovall's work, she allows for curators to add context or, you know, take away context. And she's, it's, it appears to be that she's very lenient in that way. Um, and I think for Jennifer, she's a little bit more pointed in the context that's like, because for her, a lot of the context is a part of the actual work. 
Um, so she has to be very intentional um, and ver very forthcoming with how she wants her work to be contextualized, especially since it is a work that really can't exist without her. It's like a a an ephemeral thing. Um, Maya's work is videoed. Jennifer Harge's work is not, and she's not selling the video of the work. She's selling the movement, actually. So, um, I'm yeah. I th I'm still grappling with context and like didactics, especially now being in a museum institution that is encyclopedic and so like heavy-handed with didactics. Like, how could you allow audience members to speculate? Um, and come to conclusions on your own, on their own, um, without having their hands held, for the sake of the piece. And how intentional can you be around contextualizing? I think it depends on each situation, um, and how the artist wants the work to be consumed or experienced. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I just I don't even know if it's a question, but it's yeah. ongoing. Yeah. Yeah. It's work, that's where the work is, I think, for people like me. It's like when to be didactic, when not to be, how to honor an artist. That's really my goal as a curator and writer. Sometimes that's not the goal of the institution. The goal of the institution is to satisfy patrons or ticket sales or, you know what I mean? So, um, but I think that's where the work is for me. Maya Stovall's work is doing that, you think? I mean, that was my, when mm -hmm. I saw it, I felt like it was like each little episode, mm -hmm. if you thought about them in conversation with one another, it could have been a whole new image. Yeah, yes. yeah, I agree. It's, it's definitely eth ethnography, you know, like ethnographic observation, and she'll, you know, she, she'll say that. I can't speak too much on the work because I haven't been studying it. Um, but my, what I will say is that um, my experience of the work was uh, recently at Cranbrook Art Museum, um, which was curated by uh, Laura Mott, who's the curator there, and I think it was, it was handled much more carefully and thoughtfully, um, and there was a, a, a more um, in-depth contextualization of the work. Um, but I think the difference between Harge and Maya Stovall, there are many, but in particular, um, Stovall is really interested in place and how we um, engage with place over time, over you know, a, div a divestment of resources, um, over an influx of resources. She's really working with a, a more macro type of economy. Um, and I think Jennifer Harge is very embodied and personal and interior. Um, but both are very important, and I'm glad that we can claim them in Detroit. <laughs> Let's have one more question, and I forgot to say at the outset that there's a reception after, so um, stay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, I would I would say that it's based on her personal proximity to place and not um, a group of people's proximity to place. She's not speaking on behalf of all Detroiters or you know within a specific city. Um, although her upbringing and her contemporary moment um, in the city does inform how she how she performs in a space. And I think specifically um, working in museums, like she's very slow to be in a museum context because um, it really changes her work. Um, so that's why you have like one of her first 
like uh, lengthy performances at a repurposed church because that's more true to form um, and true to like the narratives that she's interested in invoking. Um, so she really likes to place her audience within that subjective experience that she's incorporating in the work. I wish she was here with me. She would <laughs> speak better to that, but yeah, I'm trying to honor her work through my writing. Yeah, I guess, I guess more so encouraging them to meet her where she's at rather than coming to the white box space where people are a little bit more comfortable. I think she's really interested in um, making audiences uncomfortable and bringing them to where she's at. Yeah. Any other questions? Are we putting out the class? Wrap it up, wrap it up. <laughs> Thank you.